this video lecture, I'm going to teach you how to read more efficiently. Here is the agenda for the video lecture on reading. First, I'm going to introduce the three main reading strategies people use when they read. And then I am going to introduce different clues you can use when you come across unfamiliar words. And once you learn how to use them, you can read without interruption. And you can read with higher efficiency. And finally, I'm going to give you a, an overview of etymology so that you can also use it to break down unfamiliar words when you read. Okay, let's get started. To learn the three reading strategies well, we need to know the basic structure of an essay. From the writing portion of the video lecture, I have already shown you the structure of an essay, right? Particularly the body paragraphs, we have work on the paragraph components. And now I'm going to uh, introduce the introduction of an essay in details. So when it comes to the introduction of an essay, it can be broken into three parts. The first one is background. You need to tell the readers what the reading is about. And the second component here is problem. You need to tell readers why this topic is important so that you can get their attention. And finally, solution. You need to tell readers what you are going to say about this topic. For example, if today we are going to talk about divorce, then you need to offer the background about divorce. What do people know about divorce in general? And then you need to tell them why divorce matters. Okay, why divorce matters so that they can understand uh, the value of your discussion. And finally, you need to tell them what you are going to say about divorce. For example, your solution or argument can be divorce uh, poses negative impact on the well-being of children emotionally and financially. Then once people read this argument, they will know, okay, I'm going to read a discussion on how divorce uh, make children financially and emotionally insecure. Okay, so whenever you read an introduction, please identify these three components. In our lessons in the future, I'm going to ask you to do this. So now please remember what the three components are. Background, problem, and solution. And for the body paragraph, this should be something you are familiar with already. Uh, each paragraph should begin with a topic sentence and two to three supporting sentences. Okay, so we have already covered this in the writing portion of the video lecture. Now let's just skip to the conclusion. So for the conclusion of an essay, people usually do two things. First, they reiterate main ideas from the body paragraphs. Reiterate means to say something again. And then they will offer further insights about the topic. They might use one to two sentences to tell people uh, future directions of how this topic can be discussed or what they wish uh, something can be like in the future. Okay, so this is the basic structure 
of an essay, and I have also、uh, told you、uh, the components for each section. Now we can start talking about the three reading strategies. The first strategy is skimming. So, what is skimming? Skimming is the reading strategy to help readers know the gist of an article. Gist meaning main idea. So, when people want to find out the argument, main points, or purposes of the article, they need to skim. So, how do people skim? You need to read the introduction and the topic sentences from the body paragraphs only. Once we read the introduction, we will know the topic, and the importance of this topic, and the argument, right? And once we finish reading the topic sentences, we will know the main idea for each paragraph in the body. Okay, so knowing these okay sentences, main idea, we can know the gist of an article. Okay, we can know the gist of an article. The second skill is scanning. So when do people scan? We scan when we want to learn specific information, find out details that back up the argument or main ideas. So how do we scan? You will read supporting sentences to scan. Okay. So usually in the future when, uh. People ask you to read. How do you do it efficiently? You need to scan to identify the topic and scan to、uh, identify the supporting examples. Okay. By doing so, you will read much more effectively and efficiently than other people. And finally, it's the most. Careful mode of reading, which is close reading. So, when people do close reading, they want to know everything. Okay, when you want to know an article thoroughly, you will do close reading. So, how do you do close reading? You follow、uh, these steps. Okay, you scan to identify the main idea, and you scan to know the number. Of examples and what they are, and finally you will create an outline. So an outline is like a map to help you、uh, process the information from an article. We will talk about how to outline in our lecture, okay? In our lecture in the future. So these are the three reading strategies: skimming to know the gist of an article. Scanning to know the specific information of an article, close reading to know an article thoroughly, and from our lessons in the future, I will ask you to do all of them quite often. So you will definitely have different opportunities to practice them. Okay. And the second thing for the lecture about reading is context clues. So why do we need to learn context clues? We need to learn them to help us read, okay, better. So let me ask you this question: What do you do when seeing an unfamiliar word? So most people might take. Uh, out their smartphones and start looking for definitions of a word. Or if you are old-fashioned, you will、uh, take out your dictionary and look it up in the dictionary, right? But if you do those things, your reading experience will be distracted. Okay. Instead, what should you do? You should make better use of the context setting of a word. So, what does context and setting of a word mean? It means you need to use the neighboring sentences of a word better. Okay. So, neighboring sentences refers to the sentence before this word and the sentence after this word. They can tell you something about the word to help you determine an approximate meaning. If you do that, you can read without interruption. Okay, 
So now I'm going to teach you three kinds of context clues people use in reading. The first one is called example clue. So how do you know when you can use an example clue? You pay attention to punctuation marks. So if you see a column or semicolons, they signal uh, the occasion that you can use. Okay, an example clue. Or if you look, if you see words like, for example, instance, like, similar to, these are all signals of an example of using an example clue. So people give examples to present action, facts, or ideas associated with the word. So example clues can definitely help you find meaning of an unfamiliar word. Let's take a look at the second contrast clue. Um, when you see transition like but, yet, nevertheless, or however, these are signals of using contrast clue. And usually they can present opposite meaning of the word. And we can use this opposite meaning to help us know the meaning of the unfamiliar word. Now let's take a look at two examples of the contrast clue and example clue. So the first one in orange, his feelings for his cousin were ambivalent. Sometimes he delighted in her company, at other times he couldn't stand the sight of her. Ambivalent might be an unfamiliar word to most people. So pay attention to the punctuation mark here. You see column, right? This is a signal of using example clue. So read the sentence that comes after a column carefully. Sometimes he delighted in her company. So sometimes he enjoys uh, being with her. At other times, he couldn't stand the sight of her. And other times, he doesn't want her by her side at all. So we see two completely different feelings together, right? So when a person has two completely different feelings about the same thing, then this is what we call an ambivalent. It means you cannot tell whether this is good or bad or whether you like it or not. So this is the meaning of ambivalent. Okay? And then the second one, as a child, she liked to be alone and was fearful of people. But as an adult, she was remarkably gregarious. So gregarious is the word we need to find out its meaning. Uh, so here, if you pay attention to but, okay, you will know, okay, the sentence before but shows the opposite of gregarious. So let's see. Uh, like to be alone and fearful of people, which means gregarious is the opposite of being alone and being fearful of people. Okay? So through these two sentences, example sentences, you should know how useful example clues and contrast clues are. The third uh, context clue here is what we call a reinstatement clue. So reinstatement clues means synonyms. Synonyms means words with the same meanings. So why do people use synonyms in a writing? So the most obvious reason is, of course, to avoid repetition. But sometimes we use synonyms to help us clarify the main idea. We can see that very often in textbooks. And when do you know you can use a reinstatement clue. So when you look at punctuation like parentheses, dashes, a positive, so a positive refers to this sentence pattern, the new word and then comma, a sentence that defines it. Let's take a look at the example here in orange. A major buzzword in leader, leadership and management is vision. So vision, usually we know what it means. It means the ability to see. But here, in the context of leadership and management, it means something different. And we can also see the sentence pattern of an A positive here. So 
Right after the word vision, we see one sentence that defines it. So this is an example of a reinstatement clue. So vision in the context of leadership and management means the ability to imagine different and better conditions and the ways to achieve them. So a good leader must have a vision so that they can predict the future of a field. Okay. So the sentences in green and blue here are uh, some pr further practice for you. So let's take a look at the, at the green one. The Chinese novelist Ha Jing is an amazing perceptive writer. He understands human behavior in a way that few novelists can. So perceptive here is the word we need to determine the meaning. And pay attention to the punctuation mark here. You see column, right? So the sentence that comes after column is the definition for perceptive. What about the one in blue? The candidate had expected to win, but instead she was trounced by her opponent who won by a landslide. Pay attention to the transition here, but. So we can see the sentence that comes before but is the definition, okay? It's the opposite of the verb trounce. So expected to win. So the opposite of expected to win is the meaning of trounced, okay? So again, we see an example of an example clue and a contrast clue, okay? So these are the three context clues you can use. Example clues, contrast clue, and reinstatement clues. And finally, etymology can also comes in handy when you come across an unfamiliar word. But before we look into etymology, you need to know these three terms. Prefix. Prefix means a group of letters that come at the beginning of a word. And suffix means a group of letters that comes at the end of a word. And roots means words with basic meanings, and people add prefix or suffix to it. Okay, so here I would just show you some common prefixes. For example, anti means against. So antibacterial means against bacteria. Bene means good. So benefit means something good. Bi means to. So bicycle or bisexual, a person who is interested in both sexes, or bio means life, biology means the study of living things, okay? So let's take a look at these three examples. Biohazard, co-author, hyperactive, can you break them down? So bio, you should identify Okay, or recognize the prefix bio means life, hazard means danger. So biohazard means the danger of life. Co-author, so you should recognize the prefix co here. It means together. So co-author means uh, to write something together. Hyperactive, hyper means over. So hyperactive means very active. Okay, so knowing some prefixes can really help you okay a lot so here is a list of some common suffixes when you see a word that ends with able it means to can do something so portable means able to be carried around and full the suffix full means full full of so hopeful means full of hope and the suffix eyes means to make, and it is usually the end of a verb, to make. So victimize means to make someone like a victim, okay? So here are some examples. Beautify, you should recognize the ending phi means to make. So beautify means to make something beautiful, okay? Legalize, eyes, also means to make. So to make something legal. Eventful means full. So full of event means busy. So if you say, I have an eventful morning, it means your morning is quite busy. Okay, and then some common roots. Roots means 
words with some meaning, and people attach it, attach prefixes or suffixes to roots. So some common roots might be anthro, meaning human. So philanthropy, phil means love. So love human. Okay, meaning being generous, being nice to people. Aqua means water, so aquatic means something to do with water. Okay, chrono means time, so chronology means a list of events in time. So here are some examples. So here you can recognize anthro means human beings. Ology means study, so the study of human beings. Aqua means water. Rheum means place, the place with water. So aquariums is, is a place for people to watch fish or other animals in the sea in tanks. Automobile. So auto means self. So automobile refers to things that can move by themselves. Okay. So these are some common prefixes, suffixes, and roots. Of course, I encourage you to read more. And I would definitely provide you a more detailed list of prefixes, suffixes, and roots for your own, okay, self-learning, okay. So from the reading portion of the lecture, you should know how to do skimming, scanning, and close reading, and how to use context clues and how to break down, okay, a word, okay. So thank you for your time. I hope you have learned a lot.